mince, j'aime bien le pop. Hi everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to our interview with uh, Louis and Anne Moreau from Chablis. Um, this is really a, a pleasure for, for me. Um, this is absolutely one of my favorite wine regions, uh, period. Um, I've always loved uh, the wines of Chablis. Um, and we're very fortunate to work with a fantastic uh, producer from this region. Um, this is, um, you see Anne and uh, Louis there. And uh, we, we, please say hello to everyone. Yeah. Hello. Bonjour. Everybody, bonsoir, bonjour. From France. Yes. yes, and uh, thanks. And I know it's dinner time for you. So thanks for um, working with us on, on uh, US time. So uh, we wanted to, uh, present a few things about the, the domain so that um, everybody in attendance can understand um, what you're doing, uh, both in the vineyard and in the cellar. We'd love to hear a little bit about the, the history of the uh, domain, uh, but uh, I thought what we should maybe do first is to just um, give us a sense of the, the essence of Chablis. It's uh, absolutely one of my places, my favorite places. So uh, if we can start here with a few slides. Uh, just about the um, sort of essence of what Chablis uh, is about. Um, th this, for me, uh, is a place where um, you know when we when we think about how wines should um, should reflect the place that they come from and show their their terroir. Um, it really is for me. Chablis is about um, is about that. I mean. Even when, when I step out of the car, uh, when I arrive in the village of Chablis, the, even the air sort of smells a, a bit like the wines. It's just, um, it, there's a re really strong uh, connection to, to place for me. So, um, so for me, a very special place. Now, now it's not just about Chardonnay, but it's uh, definitely about terroir. It's about minerality. Um, in Chablis, and it's you know it's stony, it's hilly, uh, and it's also uh, getting a sense of a different uh, left bank, right bank, um, in order to better understand uh, obviously Chablis as a um, more regional uh, entry level, and then you move on to the uh, Premier Cruz and to the uh, to the Grand Cru. But even though within the, uh, the premier cruise, you'll find, I would say, great differences. Um, and the soil is really the key for us, what we call, again, climat, the, the terroir, is really the, the essence and the key to the personality in each, um, in each of the wines. And, and you know something? Um, we grow Chardonnay uh, everywhere in the world where, where wine is grown, and yet uh, nothing really compares to the taste of Chablis. It's, it's very unique uh, in the wine world that I think this terroir and sense of place that um, we experience in the wines is, is, is very, very strong uh, from, from your, your place, Chablis. And part of it is the, um, the location, isn't it? Because what we're at the, I suppose, 47th parallel north in the northern hemisphere. So it's quite far north and quite cool. It's the most northern part of, of Burgundy for sure. Even though we call it a continental uh, climate, um, we have a cooler, colder um, winters, especially now. It's, uh, I would say, shifted a little bit, but uh, we used to have December, January. Now we have more de uh, January and February in terms of really the, the winter period where we have a little bit of snow and it's actually good for the vine so they can be dormant and rest for that, uh, that period. Um, and then we're able to go slowly and not too soon um, into the uh, into the springtime, but that period for us is really definitely um, it's important, um, and we need that. We have just prior to the uh, to the winter, we have the, uh, the fall after harvest, where we have um, I would say the uh, more of a rainy season, October November, and then we get into that um, cooler uh, period. And, and it's not, not just the climate, but of course, the very, very special um, soil that uh, uh, we find here. We find it maybe in a few other parts of France, but um, this is this famous Kimmeridgian soil that I think gives so much of the, the identity of Chablis to the wines. Yeah. 
It's yes. a it's a calcareous soil. It's from the from an ancient sea. Um, yeah, the, the ancient sea, uh, you're looking back at 140, 135 uh, million years ago, so a long, long time ago, when actually Chablis was uh, covered with, uh, with water, um, pretty much all over what we call the Parisian basin um, that you see, I would say, partially on, um, on a map. And um, we, we are, I would say, all the way Brie, Valois, and then the Seine, then you go down, um, this is where you find, I would say, that nice Chimeridien, which is simply um, hard uh, marne, so big stone um, with, I would say, different strats of clay uh, that is, I would say, within, I would say, the, the marne. Um, so very um, hard soil. And but the top part is quite interesting. We always talk about um, sea oyster or fossilized um, oyster shells. Um, and it's when the water actually um, went out, went out, went out yeah. uh, in, uh, in that period. Um, it left, I would say, all of the, uh, the sea seashell and it fossilized nicely. But also what happened and what formed, I would say, Chablis during those years um, when the water just uh, went out, it's simply the, um, the whole um, strats basically kind of fell within each other like plates breaking down if you if you have plates falling down and then we created the valleys which we didn't have i would say before and now if you come to Chablis, you'll see that really the river bank is going to be on the bottom and then you have different valleys with different expression of that chimeridian terroir on yeah top. Oops, and and then we I think we see it um, in in parts of Sancerre, like in Chavagnol, and uh, maybe in the Aube region of, yeah. of Champagne. Aube so region, which is which is close. Yeah, but the Champagne, yeah. the southern part of the uh, the Champagne region, um, is also I would say uh, the vineyard is sitting on that. I would say yeah, really calcareous, that clay soil. But more and more, if you go afterwards on top of the of the soil, and especially plateaus, you are shifting from Chimeridien to Portlandien, so a different strat, um, less clay, a little bit more calcareous, a little bit more stony, small stone, but calcareous also. And those are more for the uh, Petit Chablis. Yeah, it, it might be interesting for people to know that it goes underneath, the Chimeridien goes underneath the English Channel and we see it um, yeah. in England. Like the snow yeah. Fascinating. Um, so this is sort of the, the big picture of the appellation of Chablis. And um, Louis, as you were just saying, uh, there's, there's a category called Petit Chablis. But yeah. typically, a Petit Chablis is, is based on um, its soil type, uh, the Portlandian soil typically. Is this right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Portlandian, the, the, what I call the, the lighter, I would say, um, calca um, light, I would say, small stone, calcareous stone um, that you have also mixed with, um, with sand. So lighter soil, quite, uh, quite interesting for the Petit Chablis, making it um, lighter, but lighter, not negative, making it more, um, a little bit more uh, tense in terms of acidity, but nice, I would say, mature acidity, but nicer, crisper, I would say, fruit on uh, on a palate. And the um, Petit Chablis are going to be on the, what we call the outskirt. Uh, if you take Chablis Village, where you see the red, um, red dot, um, and if you go on a plateau, uh, on the outskirt of, um, of the Chablis Appellation, this is where you find all of the um, uh, Petit Chablis um, vineyards, 750, almost 800 hectares today. So small, but interesting. And it's finally, for me, finding its place in terms of um, entry-level wine for the, uh, for the different markets. And, and we can see on this map the valleys that you were speaking of where um, we find the community and but, but also um, our Premier Cruz and, and the cluster of Grand Cru uh, vineyards near the uh, near the, the town. So um, good. Um, uh, would you uh, help us understand the sort of the history of this uh, this okay, fantastic so I... domain you you've put mm -hmm. together? Okay, so that's my turn. 
Um, <laughs> well, actually, uh, the Moro family has been in Chablis since 1814, and so Louis represents the sixth generation. And um, the photo you have, you're seeing right now on the ma on the screen, is actually our house, and it used to be the the winery at the same time as the house. So they were living in the place and and producing wine in the same place. Nowadays, the winery is in Ben, and so that's our house. And um, so yeah, there were um, producers and one and uh, wine merchant for almost five generations up until your father. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite common at first to have both activities. And uh, at that time, the main um, vineyards were Premier Cru Vaillon and the four Grand Cru's plus the family monopole that was bought by Louis' great-grandfather back in 1904. So yeah, in this um, the genealogical tree, you can see all the generations. And um, Louis is a sixth, and the new to come should be uh, one of our daughter, so hopefully. And uh, while we have the, the genealogical map up, um, oh. maybe we should explain, because we know um, uh, Christian Moreau wines okay. in the, sure. the US quite well. Um, and the relationship to Louis is? Oh, um, Louis' father and Christian are direct cousins, because Louis' grandfather okay. and, and Christian's father were brothers. So you see, you see Christian um, on the um, three, yeah, on the three, tree. Third, third, yeah, on the tree you will find it on the right hand, on the third mm -hmm. from the bottom, fr third layer from the bottom. You see Christian. Yes. So Guy Moreau, his father was um, Jean, yeah, Jean Jacques Moreau, which is actually Louis' grandfather, and Louis' father has the same name, so it could be a little bit confusing. But uh, um, so Christian and Jean Jacques Moreau cousin. are cousins, cousins, direct cousins, and um, so missing on the map, on this map, Fabien, which who is uh, Christian's son. And the one who now uh, is in charge with all the production at their domain. And so Very Fabien good. is Louis' second cousin. By the way, how old are Pauline and Diane, your, your, um, your children? Well, uh, Pauline will be 22 in August and Diane will be 20 in, uh, in July. And Diane is, I mean, she's keen in working with her father in a few years. So we're pretty happy with that. That was my next question. Um, <laughs> so good, that's good to hear. Um, so um, so uh, fantastic old picture here. You know, um, 1904 must be uh, an important uh, year because I believe it's the same year. Uh, did you just say that the um, Claude is uh, yes. Claude is Claude is was acquired? Absolutely. Yeah, they purchased they purchased the the parcel which is a monopole, a family monopole since then, because on, it's only property of the Moreau family. Even though we share it with Christian, it's really the same parcel. And, uh, and um, they divided it into two 50-50 you know, um, plots, if I can say, but they work it together. I mean, we, we, you work in the vineyard on a, uh, you have the same philosophy too. Yeah. So it's, it's very mm -hmm. close work together, even though it, it, each domain has its own plot of it. Uh, it's really a work accordingly one to each other. So we, we are very um, close to that yeah. for Claudius Great. Yeah. This, this is, um, by the way, this is at the bottom uh, uh, or the bottom section of Lake Law. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it's planted perpendicularly to Lake Law. When you face Lake Law, you can see that the, the vines are planted from top to the bottom while um, Claudius Ospis is planted from left to right. And we assume that it is due to the fact that before it was bought by Louis' great-grandfather, this parcel used to belong to the monks of Chablis. And so they planted it away that it was easier for them to farm it and, and to take care of it. So this is one of the reasons why it's planted uh, perpendicularly to the clue. 
Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so then, um, and by the way, we should have said you have, I believe, 50 hectares today, but, um, and we were looking at the, um, I think the documentation of acquiring the quotas also piece here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, some, oh, and a great picture there of the quotas hospice as it is mm -hmm. today. Good. It is. Uh, but um, the, you also acquired some other uh, fantastic um, parcels in Chablis. Uh, this is the uh, Grand Pièce, uh, yes. acquired in 1949 of Vaillant. That was your grandfather. Yeah, grandfather, yeah. I love this one. Yeah. Thank Still you there. for sharing all these great old photos. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a and, way to... um, So, um, we wanted to, uh, oh, and there's, there's Louis, um, sixth generation now. Um, and no. <laughs> he has a longer bear now, that's all. You know, due to confinement, you know, confinement, he has to let his bear get bigger. But here's the, the slide I wanted to get to, um, to show your, your the, the entirety of your um, holdings in Chablis. So I, I believe 50 hectares in total. Uh, but this is, um, this is for me, one of the, the really, really impressive things about um, Debain Louis Moreau is to just um, see uh, the, the range that you, you are able to offer um, with 50 hectares, a, a fairly sizable uh, domain, uh, but also uh, just to have a look at the Premier Crew holdings as well as um, I count four uh, Grand Crew, one, two, three, four, plus the monopole holding um, uh, of the Moreau family of Cotes Auspice. Um, so uh, very impressive uh, a domain. Uh, certainly the size is quite, are you, would you be one of the largest domains in Chablis? Um, yeah, number three, number, number four, four, maybe. Yeah, yeah number four. three or four. Yeah. But maybe again, because it's a family thing. I mean, nowadays, nobody would be able to recreate such a big uh, domain and, and with such a wide um, um, panel, panel, and, and, panel or, or range, you know, from Petit Chablis with Chablis, then three different premier crews, and then the four grand crews plus the monopole. It is Thanks for, I mean, thanks to this um, heritage and, 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 and sixth generation thing. Yeah. Um, and we also see on this map, um, Domaine de Bieville. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my French is not so great, but Domaine de Bieville, um, can you uh, just tell us something briefly about that? Uh, Domaine de Bieville was uh, created uh, by my dad back in uh, 1975. Um, the idea for him, even though we had the, uh, the estate, the 50 hectares of Domaine Louis Moreau, um, he wanted to have a little bit larger holdings on just um, the Chabi appellation, not Premier Cruz or Grand Cru. And he looked at different uh, parcels, different areas, left bank, right bank, and he found, I would say, the village of uh, Vivier. Um, quite, I would say, interesting because of the, the location. Uh, sitting on the pure, I would say, Kimeridian, south facing. Uh, so we have nice, I would say, maturity uh, levels. And even though it's a little bit cooler, um, it's the high point in terms of uh, altitude, 300 uh, meters for us, uh, compared to Shabi, which is on the bottom at 100. Um, so cooler, a little bit, I would say, longer time for, for ripeness and for maturity level a little bit less um, in terms of uh, yield compared to a traditional Chablis, um, but probably a Chablis that is uh, much, I would say, longer, has more um, roundness, a little bit less uh, acidity, doesn't have that crispy classic Chablis, but a very different, more truffle, more uh, mushroomy um, underwood um, tasting notes. Um, but uh, the real idea behind it was to find on 45 hectares um, more Chablis uh, to be able to sail in Europe and also back in his days was also the US and uh, Canadian market. So 45 hectares at Domaine de B and mm -hmm. then uh, another 50 hectares for Domaine Libero. This means you're very two very, very busy people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 and many more projects also. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Um, 
if you look if you look on on this map actually what what's quite interesting um and it's important for us also it's um the estate is really as you pointed out left bank right bank um which is very important because it gives us diversity in the size of wine um the right bank will bring us a little bit more older uh vineyards especially grand cru but also some of the uh, premier crus um premier cru vaillon you switch back to the um to the left bank um this is still i would say the 45 50 year old uh, vineyards and then you go to a little bit younger to premier cru voligno you're looking at 40 uh, 35 to 40 um years old but interesting because of a contrast that you can have in a style of wine and very important i would say to be and i actually like that because i can pick from different villages from different hills from different places so it's um, important it's good to have a size but it's good to really use the chablis diversity also um, and while we have the map up we should we should mention that uh, the winery itself is in is in Correct. Ben, so yeah. Ben, exactly. sorry, west of uh, west of Chablis. Hopefully, you can find it on the map there, um, uh, where, near where you see Premier Cru Volino on the map on the, the left hand side. So, um, so thank you for the, the explanation. And maybe maybe um, another thing to say here is that because you have all of these um, holdings, uh, this gives you a, a lot of possibilities to um, make the make especially this wine that I have. The, um, the Chablis, the AC Chablis, um, as complex as it is with, with um, great minerality and depth, it's, it has to um, be part of the success of that wine has to be the, the diversity oh. of holdings and the, the age of your vines. Oh, yeah. just fell. No? Um, so somebody's asking a question here about oh. how much uh, of the production of Clos de Zospis, uh, how much do you produce. So what is, is in terms of hectares, how many hectares is oh, it? 0.4. It's 0 0.4. 0 0.4 of a hectare. hectare yeah. Um, and on, I would say, it's 1,800 bottles on average. Yeah. yeah. 1,800 on bottles. Yeah. So to answer the second part of Patrick's um, question, not much, but um, <laughs> let, us, let us know uh, how much you would like and we'll We'll speak to you about it. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sending me and a picture of uh, some of your petite Chablis vineyards because um, I think this appellation is not always uh, easily understood uh, because it's a it's um, as Louis said er earlier it's oftentimes from a, a different soil series or different mm -hmm. soil type Portlandian um, and it's usually not in the valleys like the Premier yeah. Cruz. And on the hills, it's up on the uh, plateaus. But can you um, take a moment to explain this Appalachian Petit Chablis? But the um, actually the, the real um, history behind uh, Petit Chablis, and we talk about plateaus, we talk about different soil. Um, when back in 1935, uh, when we had the Appellation d'origine contrôlée, when all the producers decided to get together and in a way, kind of organize um, the appellation from Grand Cru to Premier Cru to Chablis. They actually stopped uh, at the Chablis uh, level simply because they took from the Chablis village, looked at all the vineyards around, and one of the key, I would say, um, factor was soil, and all of the hills had to look down towards the, the village of Chablis, mm -hmm. towards the river, and they left out everything on the plateaus. Um, so when a different uh, viticulteur, a different wine grower is saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you're classifying all of the Chablis, Premier Cru and Grand Cru. We are within, I would say, one or two kilometers, and we want to be part of the uh, appellation. So they were discussion for 10 years. Um, and in between 46 and the 1950, uh, they finally said, okay, we'll take the vineyards that are on the plateaus, but because they are, I would say, a little bit higher up, because it's a different soil, it's not going to go into the Chablis, but it's going to be Petit Chablis, so kind of a new classification, more the entry level. 
Good. And and what would you say um, is the main difference in taste uh, from a from a petit chablis to, for example, a chablis? Like how? Yeah. The, the, the Petit Chablis, and today for me, the Petit Chablis are finally becoming interesting, uh, probably the last five years. Um, they are, at first, Petit Chablis, they were a little bit um, greener and uh, they lack a little bit um, maturity level. But now they, they are switching towards that nice fruity, zesty, um, more crispy, but nice, I would say, um, I'm not talking about peach or melon or soft fruit or peach, um, uh, pit fruit, sorry, but more that uh, green um, lime or um, oh, uh, uh, um, grapefruit. 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 Yeah. Uh -huh. But the pink one. Yeah, pink. Pink, pink grapefruit. which is fruitier with less, um, maybe less acidity. Yes, yes, yeah. Good, good ripeness. Good. Um, so more the fruit character is more on um, the citrus and yeah. um, you're, you're probably not getting as much of the just classic um, Chablis chalkiness, I guess. It's more of a, a different sort of mineral profile. Of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and also you don't have a length that uh, a Chablis can bring you on a palate. The Petit Chablis is going to be more immediate. It's going to be more, you open a bottle, it's something that uh, you can drink, I would say, by the pool with friends as an aperitif, uh, barbecue, and uh, just, yeah, fresh and more immediate, definitely. This, this next um, wine I wanted to discuss with you, Vineyard, uh, is very important for you um, because it's, uh, it's very near your, your village. Uh, but um, this is, uh, I, I had no idea until, Anne, you sent me this picture, how steep uh, Volino is, but um, can you explain what we're, we're looking at here? Um, Premier Cru Voligno, so um, we have, uh, it's actually a very, uh, we, talk, we talk about steep hills. It's like, a, if you look at almost kind of a circus, you have to go in from the bottom. It's kind of a round, all of the vineyard is in front of you, just open as a, as a fan or as a, you know, a, a fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, you start walking a little bit and then you start to have, I would say, the hill. Um, so you start, I would say, gentle 10, 15%, I would say, uh, degrees. And then you start to move up and uh, we go up to 65%. So basically you don't need ropes, but almost, I would say, to go all the way up. It's uh, quite, I would say, drastic. Um, interesting vineyard for us it's actually a big part of the um, Voligno um, assemblage for us because it comes from different uh, vineyards um, vineyard is really stressed because of the uh, steep hills the shallow uh, soil but but nice i would say calcareous uh, soil so not a big production but very i would say nice concentration so good for i would say that color and also for the softness that you find on the end palette you you can just see when you said shallow topsoil you can just see the the white calcareous mm -hmm. hemorrhagian on the surface of the, the vineyard it's yeah. um, um, impressive to see and uh, we what what is the taste of Bruno? how would it, how is it distinctive from let's say Bayonne or another premier cru I think Voligno for us, it's very classic. And, and you find in the Premier Cru Voligno what you were talking about earlier regarding Chablis, meaning these calcareous um, iodine notes, very um, savory. And um, it's a, again, it's a very classic Chablis style wine. I mean, when we started, you know, taking after my father in law, we had quite a bad time with this parcel, I have to say, because it was very tough. And um, this wine needed an extra time to age and to evolve. And, um, um, but now it's really rewarding. And, and for me, it's a very classic example of what a Chablis has to be. And um, again, because you find this complexity of um, terroir and, and subsoil and, and, and salivary and combined with a a nice fruit. Uh, on this one, we can talk about stone, stony stone fruit. fruit. Stony fruit. So you can, you know, peachy, peach. uh, yeah. meaty, meaty, and but yet very, very refined, long length, and it stays in your mouth for a long time. And um, 
it's it's a very elegant wine, I think. And, and I can only imagine that this is, um, there's no tractor in this vineyard at all. You do everything by hand. Everything has to be done by hand because mm. because of these very steep hills, uh, we cannot choose machine in it. And, and furthermore, I mean, when we harvest, everything is done by hand and the, the pickers, they start from the top and they go down, you know, like we do in the mountains, for example, they have to go step by step going down toward the bottom because they, mm -hmm. they cannot go up anyway in this one. Um, and so uh, thank you for that. And um, I should have said to the audience earlier, so apology, apology, but if you have a question for Anne or Louis, just write it in the, um, the Q&A box and uh, I'll read the question to them uh, for you. So, um, and in fact, some uh, Jackie is asking, um, I see the spelling of Volino has uh, changed to Volino <laughs> on your new vintage. Um, is it just for the US market? No, 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 not at all. It's just because, um, um, uh, yes, it's, it's more historical. I mean, you can spell it either or. In one word with OT at the end and in two words. And for many, many years, we used to use this, I mean, uh, one word spelling. But um, it's, we noticed that it's more and more com and confusing for people. And not only for the US, but in, in many other countries, because of the maps the spelling appears within two words. So we finally decided after 20 something years, we've decided to move on to the two word spelling. And so from vintage 2018, we are using Voligno in two words. And, and somewhere I think it's a little, it's nicer, it's maybe softer because you don't have the T at the end. I, I find it on, on most maps spelled uh, as two words. So um, uh, yeah. good. Um, oh, and someone, um, Todd, is asking, what changes have you observed and do you anticipate in response to climate change? Oh, it's a very <laughs> good question, too. Um, no, no, but on va répondre à la première, peut-être. Alors, about the changes, um, yes, we do see notice changes. Uh, on my little um, window, as we said in French, um, I would say that, for example, um, you saw earlier on the photos, we had a photo with snow. Uh, nowadays, it's um, less, it happens less and less that we get snow in, in, in winter, even though winters are cold. They used to be much colder in the past. So we tend to have more and more a mild season, even in, 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 in winter. That means that the plant doesn't um, rest as much as she, she could do or she used to. Mm. And so nowadays, um, we, we fear much more the frost spring than we used to because when spring frost arrives, I mean, when the time of the spring frost arrives, uh, the plant is already grown up. And so the damages on this plant uh, due to the spring frost are much more uh, important compared to what they used to be maybe 20 years ago, for example. So that's one of the bad points of the global warming. In another hand, the good thing we see that we notice is that we harvest sooner compared to 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, we tend to harvest by mid-September when we used to harvest, uh, harvest uh, early October. So we have like two weeks ahead in advance, and that means better conditions to harvest, drier time, um, uh, good temperatures yet, and and good and good maturity on, on the grapes. So you know we have bad effects, and but we also find some positive effects on it. Speaking of, of um, good maturity on the grapes, uh, this is Grand Cru Vamour that we're looking at, and that just looks like a very nice sunny. Uh, almost amphitheater uh, to collect the heat and get uh, lots of brightness. This is, um, I think, typical of Valmour, isn't it? The, the ripeness, the power. Uh, Valmour, Valmour is probably the, the one that is the most, uh, yeah, powerful, if I may say, compared to Blanchot, which is just above the hill in front of you, uh, Les Clos and Blanchot. Um, again, this is where you have, I would say, that nicer um, slope going up, and this is where you get uh, quite a bit of sun, you know, that nice uh, south-facing, south 
and you have on both sides uh, the other sun, uh, morning and afternoon uh, sun. So again, smaller yield, but um, good maturity. It's probably one of the plots that we, we do harvest um, early um, to preserve the, the acidity level. Um, and no matter what, and no matter the vintage, it's always very round and has that nice, yeah, um, powerful depth uh, onto a wine uh, on the palate, sorry. David is asking a follow-up question about Bolino. He wants to know um, if, uh, are you the majority owner or is it a... Uh, I want no. you to answer to this question because I've seen it on the, on the, on the screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and he's right. Um, Bolino is one of the latest parcel, parcels that has been um, upgraded as a premier cru back in 1979. It represents 30 hectares and we own 10 hectares of it. And in total, there are only six proprietors for this one. So it's maybe not a very famous um, premier cru, but I think again, that it's a very interesting and very classic Chablis yeah. style one. Fantastic. Um, it's a good jump, if I may say it's a good jump. It's a nice, I would say, from Chablis, you want to discover the, uh, the premier cru, I would say, level. There's a lot of different premier crus in, uh, in Chablis, 42. Um, but it's a nice, I would say, kind of, door to push into the, the Premier Cru um, because as Anne was saying, it's, it's multi-exposition, um, um, multi-facet um, exposure onto the palate. So you can have, I would say, stony dryness. You have also maturity. So it's quite, quite interesting. And um, Ian was asking if you were affected by spring frost this year, so um, vintage 2020. Uh, no, no we, had, we had a few, though. we had a few difficult nights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we spent what, uh, probably about a week, so five nights out um, looking at the thermometers, uh, but nothing, nothing drastic, thank God, um, compared to the past, I would say, 19, 18, 17, where we had, I would say, some, um, uh, some damages. So this year, no, everything is, um, is good. Good, good, good so far. It's actually one, one of the years um, so far for the, the soon to come vintage 2020. Um, the, the vineyard is really looking amazing. Uh, the pressure in terms of uh, mildew and uh, odium, so powery mildew is really really, really low um, and no alteration on the grapes so far. So we're looking in terms of quality wise for good, uh, good vintage. It, this is a, this is really good news in 2020. We want some, we want to hear good news like that. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> us, us too. Yeah. <laughs> um, how old are the, the vines in the Clos des Hospices? Uh, 55, 56. Uh, no. Yeah. 56 yeah. because they replanted yeah, some of them. Average would be 56. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say, is this your, um, is this in your range, the, the fullest body, the, the richest wine, the, the, the most structured wine? Probably rich, richest. Uh, the one with the most structure uh, in a Grand Cru, probably um, Les Clos. Uh, mm -hmm. Powerful one is Valmur, yeah. and um, it's the more uh, Claude Sosis, in my opinion, is the more complete because it gets the um, structure of Les Clos, but with some more mildness and more fruitiness. You see, Les Clos yeah. is kind of like a knight, very straightforward, very sharp, but um, Claude Sosis ten tends to have a little bit more um, suppleness and more fortunate in it. So I would say it's a little bit more complete. Surely, surely the, the qualities of uh, Grand Cru, uh, the completeness of the wine, it's, um, it's not always that it's the biggest wine, but it's uh, uh, everything yes. is in perfect proportion. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we, we've already asked you a few questions about your philosophy um, in the vineyard, but I, I think it's really important uh, that we um, learn about your approach to sustainability and how you've been working. Um, you, you really work in an organic way, especially in the, the crews, but can you um, say a few words about your farming philosophy? We're, we're changing, we're evolving, I would say probably at a faster pace than um, 
than I thought uh, myself. We've we've been doing all of the Grand Cruise and the Premier Cruise and on an organic uh, base in terms of what we call farming. Um, so like no chemicals, um, and which was tricky probably uh, ten years ago, uh, but now it's becoming more and more I would say obvious uh, for us. Um, now what we're trying to do is to go um, one step further uh, with, I would say, turning all of the other uh, Chablis and even the uh, Petit Chablis for Domaine Wimoreau. Um, so we're giving us, what, five years uh, to go more and, um, uh, yeah, probably to get full certification for uh, organic. Um, we have to be careful for um, the weather. And yes, the weather is changing. So is it going to help us? I hope. Um, and then we're trying to find, I would say, alternatives right now. Um, where, what is really time consuming and uh, where we really need to find, I would say, the solution is soil and plowing um, because you don't have any weed killers anymore. Um, so you need to manage, I would say, the grass and you need to manage the weeds uh, in order to have, I would say, reasonable and um, a good, I would say, even competition between the, the vine and also what you have in rows. So um, it's, a, it's a challenge for us, but I would say step by step, um, we're, getting, we're getting there. So um, you would have asked me the question two, two, three years ago, I would have said, no, we'll stay at that level. But now I think, and it's not even for communication, but it's more the, the quality that we have for the grapes uh, in Premier Cru and Grand Cru, where you have, I would say, no alteration. You have a maturity level you want at harvest. We can really pick and choose. Um, it pushes you to, to think more and to do the same for the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the estate. So um, big challenge, but um, yeah, definitely we're going to go there. Working on it. We, we already saw in some of the photos that um, Lake Bolino is so steep and you wouldn't possibly be able to farm work, work the vineyard with a tractor. So um, it's a lot of handwork, I think. And um, uh, people always ask the question about um, uh, harvesting and that many producers in, should they use the harvesting machine? And you always hear uh, a, sometimes a debate that it's a, it's a good thing and others say, no, it's, um, it, and harvesting is better, but what is your, your philosophy? If I would say, obviously, hand harvesting for the, uh, the older vines, the Premier Cru and Grand Cru, is um, obvious for, for, for us and, and for many people also, uh, because you have to be very careful uh, in your, I would say, management. You want to really bring uh, the grapes, the berries, in, I would say, the best possible condition to the winery. So no crushes, no juice. Um, so really you're taking care of that uh, with, I would say, as you say, the, the yellow baskets. Um, and then the transport is now not in big bins, but it's into individual um, bins and everything is sorted. Everything is, I would say, um, pressed gently. So um, it's really a specific um, management. Um, machine harvest today is uh, for Petit Chablis and Chablis um, in terms of efficiency, in terms of economical cost also, is definitely a good solution. Um, we have, in, like in many places in France and in Europe, uh, problems also with um, trying to find, I would say, the people um, to come to harvest. So um, yeah, the harvesters do work well as long as you manage, you have a good, I would say driver, a good machine that is, I would say, well set. And the key thing behind that is to respect between what you harvest, so what you get from a harvester, you put in a bin and you bring back, you need to have, I would say, the shortest time possible to bring, I would say, the harvest back to the press um, in order not to have any kind of um, oxidation of a juice or any changes into the, um, the possible, I would say, juice that you have from the machine. So you need to be, it's not just picking, but it's also to be very uh, efficient behind it. So yeah. I remember I, the two. 
I, I asked you about your um, machine harvester before, and uh, I, you were uh, very happy with with the one that you use. The, the, um, it does a really, really good job of um, uh, taking good care of the grapes and things. So. Yeah, definitely, we we are fortunate to have um, still today a French uh, manufacturer uh, in Cognac, so in um, uh, Cognac region, um, and we we send actually. Our, our three drivers are actually going down in July. They're spending four days um, to, I would say, better learn how to drive it. Um, uh, how to be, I would say, um, yes, efficient, but careful with, I would say, the, um, the grapes. So um, every year they, they go down and uh, we're trying to be, I would say, as, um, as yeah, clean and as, I would say, uh, good to the grapes with the machines. Um, and uh, your vineyard manager here, this is uh, Remy. Remy. Yeah. yeah, Remy, yeah, he's been with us for, for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and 14, uh, 14 already? <laughs> yes. Okay, so time flies. Um, but um, he's probably the one who brought us, I would say, and uh, uh, pushed me, I would say, more into organic into um, reduction dose uh, for even even though we use um, sulfur and we use copper also for um, for spraying but if we can go into I would say reduction I would say doses use less and less um, yeah we're doing different programs um, better management of a soil in terms of fertilization obviously organic it's an amendment that we bring to the soil but uh, we really take, I would say, soil samples and then we adapt, I would say, to each, uh, each vineyard. So many, many small things, but um, it's uh, the, the key uh, to, I would say, to be, I would say, successful in the vineyard management. And the same also for uh, the winery is just a sum of details. And you have to look at all those details, I would say, to, um, to be, I would say, to be on top. Um. We, I wanted to uh, ask you about your philosophy in the cellar um, because we know, we know, of course, that um, many producers um, work with uh, wood barrels and then there are some that famously um, only use uh, inox or stainless steel tanks. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think this is uh, important for, um, for us to understand is your, your winemaking style and your philosophy in the cellar. And, um, uh, great picture here of the, the cellar with all of these small tanks. We've, we've changed, I would say, quite um, quite a bit. Um, we used to use, I would say, um, barrels for some of the premier crus and grand cru on a more, I would say, widely um, base. Uh, but what we're doing, because of the, uh, the vineyard management, as I said, it's a sum of details and uh, we're getting more and more, I would say, better maturity we want to express in our cuvées um, all of the i would say the each vineyards uh, that we bring in we're trying to express i would say those differences whether it's going to be a premier cru voligno a vaillon les fourneaux uh, or of a different um, um, grand crus also and um, we prefer to have i would say tanks that are adapted i would say to each vineyard almost and to have a content that is as neutral as possible and be able to um, express vintage, of course, but also the parcel and uh, whether you're going to have, I would say, that nice, I would say, minerality, that saltiness, that fruit aspect, really it's um, our vinification trying to be as neutral as possible to have a better expression of each, uh, each vineyard. Um, your, your, the wines are always from your domain. They're always very, very clear from one, one crew to the next. You can really see the differences in the wine and it must um, have something to do with this, uh, I would call this micro vinification, but uh, you know, just keeping every parcel uh, separate uh, and then um, being very, very precise, I guess, about um, how you put it together. Yeah, and, and everything we can, I would say, take out. Um, the first was, for example, the yeast management, what I call for um, alcoholic fermentation. Uh, we used to have a specific strain back. Uh, today, everything is um, 
it's wild uh, yeast, uh, indigenous yeast, sorry, um, inoculation. So everything comes in, it's um, core stabilized down to 15 degrees. Uh, so we have uh, just a static um, uh, racking uh, after pressing uh, 24 hours, just very gentle, not too drastic because we want to keep at nice, I would say, the fine leaves um, on the bottom of the time because we're going to use that afterwards for that long period of vinification that we, we use. And even though it's at 15 degrees, no yeast added, um, we let, I would say, the wine, so it's slowly going to start, I would say, alcoholic fermentation takes two, three days, we follow the tank, and then we have a much um, cooler, cleaner uh, alcoholic fermentation, probably three weeks, four weeks, uh, sometime uh, five weeks, but it's okay, we, we control it, compared to before where it was one week, 10 days, um, hotter, a little bit more drastic, um, and there with that process, we are able to retain much more of the aromatic in all of the cubase. Is there ever um, a, a maceration on the skins uh, at the beginning? So it goes to press, you press immediately, uh, and then yeah. there's a spontaneous fermentation. Is that um, from a pied de cube or is it, how do you do the um, No, no, we, we just let it, I would say, we let it, um, I would say, go by itself. Uh, we find, and actually we are being curious about the strain of yeast, and we would like to send it, I would say, as a lab uh, that can do the testing in, um, in Nantes um, to see exactly the strain. But once you've done that for repeatedly for a number of years, the yeast strain is, is in a cellar, and it just, I would say, starts by itself. And obviously when you have, I would say, the volume after 10 days, um, everything starts, I would say, very gently. Uh, you don't need to do a pied de cube like we used to do uh, for the uh, strainer yeast used before. And um, the, the time on the, the lees, is there um, ever a, uh, do you ever stir the lees back in? Is there ever a batonnage or is it just a... Um, um, the batonnage is going to be done on, for example, the Valmur is going to be done on the, um, on a premier cruise. Uh, actually more grand cru than the premier cru and then um, except for Voligno where we put the lees just I would say not in suspension but on the bottom of a tank and we just leave I would say the wine just to naturally feed itself from the um, from the lees uh, again but we are careful with that I would say management of stirring uh, the lees, bringing that nice what we call auto lees into the uh, onto the wine, um, and also the management of oxygen uh, that you can have in each um, each cuvee. So um, we try to be as probably very strict, and sometimes we have a little bit austere wine after uh, for the premier cruise. You're looking at 18 months. Grand Cru, you're looking at 24 months, 22, 24 months uh, before I would say the bottling. Um, a little bit austere at first, uh, but it's nice because it's much more of um, what I call the calcareous austerity uh, or soil austerity, and the wine just do find, I would say, their, um, that power after six months, after you know, uh, one year after bottling. And um, a picture of, of your uh, cellar master, Eric Stanger here, and um, the, uh, it must be an older picture because uh, you still have the barrels here. And, yeah, and you, you, barrels, yeah. you said yeah. earlier, now, even the, all the Grand Cru's, everything right. is entirely 100% yeah. stainless yes. steel. Um, Absolutely. We, we probably are, I would say. Um, Oat management in Chablis is and it's something we can talk, I would say, quite a lot about it. But I think uh, more and more uh, sellers and um, winemakers are thinking twice about using it in Chablis and they're being, being probably more and more partial. Uh, what you see today is um, stainless steel first, pretty much, and then at the end of, um, I would say, vinification and the aging period before bottling, you have partial um, oak, I would say, aging a third of a cuvee or half of a cuvee or 20%, depending. So people are being 
uh, careful and they are changing also the size of the, um, um, the barrels to larger uh, size so they can be as um, mutual as possible. The oak needs to be uh, behind um, and not in front of, uh, of the wine, really just to uh, accompany, really to, to take it along, just to bring a little bit more complexity. And, and after all, the, um, the Chablis is, is, it's, is the terroir. I mean, yeah, we want to experience that, right, and not the, the flavor of wood or, or other things. So, um, uh, we had a fantastic question. I love this question as a, um, a sommelier. Um, Nanette is asking about your regional uh, food and wine pairings. Um, what, what do you like to uh, eat with your wines? Well, um, depending on the wine, obviously, but um, as Louis was saying earlier, Petit Chablis is just perfect to be, you know, consumed or, or enjoyed by itself. It doesn't need anything else. Uh, maybe some cheese, you know, free cheese, like uh, either goat cheese or, or Comté. Uh, Comté, Comté, which is very, um, very common here to, to, to pair with the Petit Chablis. Um, if you talk about Chablis, I would rather go into more... Um, Fish and, uh, and 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 oysters. I mean oysters. Ask for I mean oh oh Chablis ask for oysters. You can uh, you can see it either or. Um, regarding the premier cru, you can go into more uh, for Voligno, for example. It's it's still a very sea food and 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 um, and again oysters, uh, fresh um, fish, kind of wine. On the contrary, with uh, Les Fourneaux, we tend to be a little, little bit rounder. Uh, we didn't have time to talk about it, but I mean, it's, um, it faces south and it's a very stony area. So you can you tend to have warmer um, um, exposure and so riper grapes in, in Les Fourneaux. And this one, you could perfectly serve it with some uh, uh, grilled scallops or with even um, um, risotto with some mushrooms and something a little bit earthy and creamier. And talking about Grand Cruz, well, I would say that Le Clos is perfect with a nice um, uh, turbot. Turbo. We said turbo. turbo. You know the fish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, turbo with a creamy, creamy sauce and something a little bit uh, thicker, more, more, more structured. And um, Valmur is perfect with some uh, um, veal, uh, uh, white meat. You can you can even go on onto meat with a uh, with a uh, risotto. Concru and, uh, and again a risotto with or some mushrooms, uh, um, parmesan cheese. Again parmesan cheese and and and, and uh, oh, uh, truff truffles. Oh, truffles. Fantastic. I I um I used to love. Of course, for me, it's Chablis, especially the the AC Chablis is uh, the the ultimate oyster wine for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I thank you for mentioning Turbo, my favorite uh, fish, and it's <laughs> it's some something about um, Chablis. I think wants the flavors on the plate to be not too. Um, I don't think too complicated, but something very high quality, and the sh the the wine almost. Uh, enhances the flavor of the dish. And this is what I like about uh, turbo with a, uh, a cream sauce or a bourbon blanc or something. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's fantastic with uh, the style uh, that you produce. So, um, well, uh, thanks Nanette for asking that uh, question. Um, I want to say thank you to Anne and Louis Moreau for spending the, the hour with us. Um, we learned a lot from you. It's really a pleasure. I know you have work, lots of work in the, the vineyard and in the cellar to do all the time. So, and it's your dinner time. So um, you know, we, we really appreciate your time. But, uh, but you, if you have spare people, we're looking for 10, 15 people, extra people for the vineyard <laughs> for, for harvest. harvest. Uh, Please, so come Please come over. Please come over. <laughs> if you can travel, if you can take a plane, <laughs> do come and see us. <laughs> that, that's very tempting. I don't know if we'll have to be in quarantine or not, but we thank you for the offer. <laughs> um, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, you again. Santé. Enjoy. Santé. Enjoy. And see you in And if you have, if you have uh, other questions, I would say don't hesitate mm -hmm. to, to pass it through um, um, to us. And, uh, you know, we can answer uh, questions afterwards. You know, definitely. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. We will do that. Yeah. Anna-Louis, thank you.
Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Bye Santé. bye. Ciao. Bye.